For being the most popular Disney park in the world, it's strange to me that the Magic Kingdom's Fantasyland is just so, well, oddly underwhelming. It has obviously changed quite a bit since opening, closing 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea in 1994, or replacing Mr. Toad's Wild Ride with the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh in 1999. Its most dramatic change would come in 2012 though, with the addition of New Fantasyland, having opened on December 6th. While it has been quite 10 years as of the making of this video, it's close enough, and I do think it would be interesting to do a bit of a retrospective of this land and how it failed to accomplish its goal of adding any significant capacity to Magic Kingdom. That was its primary purpose, and yet even with its existence, Fantasyland overall still just feels completely underbuilt, especially if you compare it to its counterpart in Disneyland. A huge strength there is its abundance of small but charming dark rides that cover Peter Pan, Snow White, Pinocchio, Mr. Toad, and Alice in Wonderland. There is also the Storybook Land Canal Boats, in addition to the Casey Jr. Train, the original It's a Small World, and of course the Matterhorn. If we include the flat rides like Dumbo, the Carousel, or the Teacups, that brings Disneyland's Fantasyland up to 12 actual rides. Yet, for taking up a much larger space and seeing much higher attendance, Magic Kingdom only has 7 and goes up to 9 if you include Storybook Circus. When people who aren't really theme park fans think of Disney, you know that they probably associate it with Fantasyland or Disney's animated films. It's their strongest brand image, and yet, Magic Kingdom's Fantasyland really kind of fails to deliver on this. So, why? Today, I think it would be interesting to answer that question by taking a more in-depth look into the land overall, but focusing on why the new Fantasyland expansion has really failed to reach its goals of expanding the land in any meaningful or interesting way. For being Disney's most marketable land, they've really failed to keep it interesting, so let's really break down why this is the case and see what could be done to fix it. Let's first start by discussing the states of the older portion of the land. Starting first in the west side, I don't have any footage of it, but the tangled bathrooms are, well, themed bathrooms. This was part of the new Fantasyland expansion and attempted to open up a new pathway in this infamous bottleneck that leads directly to the Haunted Mansion. However, because of the placement of the bathrooms, there's always strollers and ECVs parked around everywhere and so I'm not entirely sure if this even helped alleviate bottlenecking in this area. Sure, the pathway was expanded, but the large bathrooms draw everyone over there and gives them a reason to stand around. So, did it really help alleviate crowds? I don't really know, but I'm inclined to think that by giving people a reason to stand there, it didn't. Moving on, Peter Pan's Flight is a classic, but it hasn't really received any updates to keep the experience fresh with projections and updated effects, as with the version in Disneyland. While it is true that the queue was expanded and includes a nice, atmospheric indoor section as part of the new Fantasyland project, the ride itself isn't too remarkably different from how it opened in 1971. I think the reason for this is that it's one of those situations where Disney guests, who would take a once-in-a-lifetime trip to the Magic Kingdom, would complain if it closed. If it's not immediately broken, why bother fixing it? Still, I really think that Disney could refurb the attraction during the early parts of the year around January and February, bringing in those projections and updated effects that allow the Disneyland version to stay fresh. Across the way is It's a Small World, which I find to be one of the strongest attractions in the park. Is it as good as the Disneyland version? Of course not, but I also think it manages to stand on its own, especially since pretty much all versions of this ride can be pretty different depending on which Disney park you're in. Here, I really like how the queue and facade are indoors, and how you can look into the attraction from the Pinocchio Village House. I don't have the footage of it, but this part was also repainted recently with a lot more color, and it fits really well. 
However, It's a Small World and Peter Pan's Flight are really the only two attractions I enjoy in Magic Kingdom's Fantasyland. Over by where Mr. Toad's Wild Ride used to be, the Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh is a rather underwhelming experience. I don't recall which video I previously stated this in, but I was surprised to see a lot of people defending this attraction. Still, I find it to be just generally uninteresting in its execution, and with the introduction of Genie Plus, Disney destroyed the queue by flooding it with Lightning Lane reservations, so it's not even an attraction that you could just casually walk onto like in the past. There's absolutely no way that this is worth a 60 minute wait. As with most things I will discuss in this video, I will also mention that the Disneyland version is much more interesting, even if theirs isn't located in Fantasyland. There is also the Mad Tea Party and the Prince Charming Regal Carousel, which do add some capacity and have some interesting history within the park, but they don't make up for the lack of attractions in general. There is also Mickey's Philhar Magic, and like the show it replaced, the Mickey Mouse Review, it's amusing but incredibly outdated, even if Disney has added a bit more to it recently. To finish off this area, there is also Princess Fairy Tale Hall, which is a meet and greet space that replaced one of my favorite past attractions, Snow White's Scary Adventures, as part of the new Fantasyland project. It's an unfortunate and ultimately unnecessary loss, so let's transition to why it's such a big problem next. Before we dive into this though, please do me a quick favor and leave a like if you enjoy video essays like these. A lot of time and effort goes into video production, so leaving a like and subscribing if you haven't done so is an easy way to show me some support. One of the largest issues with Magic Kingdom's version of this land is the lack of interesting dark rides. In Disneyland, they are signature attractions that achieve excellence through their intimacy, and managed to pack in a lot of contents while taking up a really small footprint. While I do prefer Snow White's Scary Adventures, I do at least appreciate the new major refurb, which is now known as Snow White's Enchanted Wish. It manages to update the ride in a meaningful way, even if it takes out the scarier elements that gave the original attraction its charm. It's unfortunate that this wasn't done to the attraction in Magic Kingdom though, as I definitely considered it a classic worth preserving and updating. To replace it with a meet and greet though? That's unforgivable. Still, I at least understand that the ride was removed because Disney was building Seven Dwarfs Mine Train across the way, obviously using the Snow White IP as well. I might have been more forgiving if this coaster had turned out better though, as it's definitely one of Disney's weakest attractions. In fact, I've previously done a video aptly titled, Seven Dwarfs Mine Train is a Waste of Space so you can definitely check out my more in-depth thoughts on how weak the theming is there. It's also worth noting that for a roller coaster, it lacks any sensation of thrill, and perhaps it would be redeemable if it had more than one single scene. So, in failing to deliver on both fronts, it ultimately takes up a plot of land that could be better utilized, and ultimately led to the removal of another great attraction. You might be thinking though, if this attraction is so bad, why is it so popular? Well, it has become clear to me that the standards and expectations of Disney guests have declined quite a bit over the last few decades. Remember when there was widespread hatred for Primeval Whirl, or the latest version of Journey into Imagination? Why is that mediocrity in such high demand today? I don't really know, or have an answer to that. I know that there will be people in the comments who would take this criticism of the ride personally, because their kid enjoyed it, you don't need to tell me that but that has absolutely no impact on this being a rather poor attraction. Again, if it fails as both a coaster and a dark ride, what's the point? If you want to go introduce your young child to a roller coaster, go ride the Barnstormer. In the original plans for New Fantasyland though, this plot of land was originally intended as meet and greet space, which considering how this project resulted in the removal of Scary Adventures, was probably a better use of the land. I can certainly understand the desire and need to expand meet and greet space for Disney's most popular characters, but New Fantasyland fails even in this aspect. The Enchanted Tales with Belle was interesting because it turned the concept of a meet and greet into an interactive experience of sorts, but in conjunction with the Be Our Guest restaurant, takes up a lot of space that would be better served with an attraction. 
I heard great things about Be Our Guest when it first opened, but the food quality has declined dramatically since then, and you're now essentially paying for the atmosphere. I did go recently, mostly to add to my library of footage, and I can personally attest that the experience can only be described as chaos. The seating process was held up by people who were whining that they couldn't get a reservation, even though I got one on a whim just a few hours earlier. A few years ago, the restaurant did switch to a prefix menu, mostly so that they could prepare a limited selection of dishes and throw them under a heat lamp until people were ready to order them. At least, that's the impression I got from the quality of the brick of pork that I received for my entree. I will say that the appetizers and desserts were acceptable, but their execution wasn't particularly complicated and seemed very easy to mass produce. For being one of the most in-demand restaurants at Disney, the food isn't great and you're only really there for the experience. It's difficult to not look at the stunning Beauty and the Beast attraction in Tokyo and see how much space is wasted with both this restaurant and Enchanted Tales. I will say that the little village area past the castle fares a bit better, as the shop has some interesting artwork, and Gaston's Tavern is well themed, even if the actual food they serve is unremarkable, even by quick service standards. Still, as with Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, I think I would sum up the Beauty and the Beast area as a waste of space. You could certainly fit not just one, but multiple attractions here, and while I'm unsure whether the Tokyo attraction could fit in this space, it certainly makes me wish that they had tried something more interesting or ambitious. Moving further down the path, we have Under the Sea, Journey of the Little Mermaid, which is an Omnimover dark ride that takes you through the story of the film. While the outside facade of Prince Eric's castle is well sculpted, and the queue itself is great and atmospheric, the ride itself really underdelivers. Part of the reason for this starts with the queue itself, which promises something much more exciting than just a mediocre retelling of the events from the film. I have seen this attraction get a lot of hate, but I definitely don't feel that strongly about it. In fact, I really do like it as a sea ticket that often doesn't have much of a weight, especially considering how crowded the rest of Magic Kingdom usually is. The problem that I often see cited though, is that there was an idea for a Little Mermaid attraction originally drawn up by Tony Baxter. I'm not really attached to this creative vision though, because judging from the conceptual rendering that Disney released, it seems only marginally more interesting than the actual ride we got. So, why does this attraction seem to underdeliver? Well, a criticism I often observe is that people seem to really dislike a lot of the mostly static figures found throughout the ride that only have minimal movement. I actually disagree quite heavily with this because one of my largest issues with current Disney is how they tend to blow all of their budgets on novelty animatronics. Sure, the one or two of them that you used are quite fluid, but the rest of the attraction seems bare and devoid of interesting scenes. I would much rather see a lower level of animation, but have scenes that feel completely fleshed out, allowing you to spot something everywhere you look. It's a Small World is a great example of this, and I very much appreciate the execution of the Under the Sea segment in Journey of the Little Mermaid. That's not to mention that the ride is also full of other fully realized audio animatronics, some of which are particularly impressive, such as Ursula. On a foundational level, the ride seems like it should be a solid experience, so, why is it then so underwhelming? Well, my diagnosis is that it's just simply an issue with pacing. The slow-moving Omnimover was definitely the wrong choice here, as it's a great vehicle for allowing you to take a long, extended look at a scene. Slow-moving vehicles work great in attractions like Spaceship Earth, The Haunted Mansion, or Pirates of the Caribbean, because those scenes were designed to fully take up your time and allow you to observe more elements the longer you look. Other than the Under the Sea segment, this is not the case with The Little Mermaid. As a retelling of the story of an animated film, the method of delivery would be far better if the ride system was done in the same style as those classic Disneyland dark rides. They summarize the plots of those films, but do so at a quick pace, allowing for an almost thrilling experience as you whip around corners and catch snippets of story. Imagine a Little Mermaid version of an attraction like this, 
really flying through its scenes as you bang past a glow in the dark plywood cutout of Ursula as a sound cue plays and strobes blind you overhead. Are these attractions a bit primitive by today's standards? Sure, but they definitely have a lot of charm to them, and that's what makes them great. Their stories are not always coherently told, but it's easy to overlook this because the point is the fun, thrills, and atmosphere. In contrast, the slow-moving nature of The Little Mermaid seems to focus on drawing out these musical segments, and while each scene is well executed technically, the lack of cohesion between them becomes evident. I think that unless you're going to design something as quickly paced as those Disneyland dark rides, retelling the story of an animated film is generally a bad design choice because the point of a slow-moving attraction should be atmosphere, rather than just recreating scenes that you could just watch at home. As you can tell, these scenes are also designed around playing music from the film on a loop, instead of actually filling up the duration of your time as you move past them. There's a great persuasive essay I stumbled upon recently, published by Kira Prince on her website Theme Park Concepts, where she makes the point that by focusing so heavily on the music in the ride, it works to the detriment of both the scenes and the music. The music itself wasn't designed to be played in a loop like a Sherman Brothers song, and so you're really missing the full impact of the music from the film, which is the appeal of it in the first place. Because these scenes are not designed around filling up your time, as I previously stated, they're just small, unfulfilling segments from the film, which obviously executes the musical segments much better. Prince also diagnoses the issue of the Omnimover system working against the ride because of this as well. Overall, I find it to be a little better than average in execution, but suffers mostly from pacing issues. Before I move on to offering my fixes for Magic Kingdom's Fantasyland, I would like to briefly discuss Storybook Circus, though. Having replaced Mickey's Toontown Fair, which was just a lesser version of the land in Disneyland, Storybook Circus did Fantasyland the favor of moving Dumbo away from the main pathways and helping by cloning another spinner to double the capacity. It also rethemed the Barnstormer a bit, adding better theming to fit in with the circus as a runaway airplane act. Overall, the area is fine, and also serves its purpose of adding meet and greet space for a number of popular characters in Pete's Silly Sideshow. The only issue is that this corner of the park seems a little kinetically dead, and probably would have benefited from another flat ride or two. I think that the theming is a welcome addition compared to what came before, but I do still prefer Mickey's Toontown in Disneyland, especially since it already has a quality dark ride with Roger Rabbit's cartoon spin. Now that I've covered my thoughts on Magic Kingdom's Fantasyland overall, let me offer solutions for how it could be fixed and enhanced. So, what are Fantasyland's largest issues? Well, in my opinion, it's a lack of capacity and a lack of representation from actual Disney animated films. Again, for being the largest draw to the largest theme park in the world, why does it lack rides? So my first solution is bringing in more dark rides done in that classic style as with Disneyland. Personally, I would like to see Fairy Tale Hall ripped out with a new version of Snow White's Enchanted Wish replacing it. On the other side, I would remove the dated Mickey's Philhar Magic, replacing it with one of those rides, but unique to Magic Kingdom. Since Cinderella's Castle is the icon of the park, I think it only makes sense to produce a Cinderella dark ride in this space. Still, I've only just restored one ride and ripped out a theater in favor of a dark ride with trivial capacity. Mickey's Philhar Magic can seat a maximum of 500 people every 12 minutes. Realistically, that's about four shows every hour, eating up 2,000 people compared to the likely 500 a small Cinderella dark ride would produce. Even so, I think that something needs to replace Philhar Magic eventually. Because I've just made capacity worse though, I have other ideas to absorb the crowds. Moving to the east side, I would tear out the Tomorrowland Speedway because it takes up a huge plot of land. I would then use this space to then build multiple show buildings. To the south, near Tomorrowland, I would use it for a Tomorrowland-themed dark ride. As to what that ride would be, I have a vague idea for an indoor version of the Speedway using electric vehicles and allowing riders to drive around alien landscapes. I'm not really going to go into that here though, as it's not the focus of the video. 
However, separating this from Fantasyland would be a themed arch to help transition between Fantasyland and Tomorrowland, as this is probably one of Disney's worst transitions in their parks. The Northern Show building on the Fantasyland side would house an Alice in Wonderland dark ride though, similar but distinctly different from the version in Disneyland. One of the strengths of that ride is how radically different each scene is, allowing the experience to remain dynamic and offer a lot of variety to riders, which I think is what makes an adaptation of it the perfect fit for Magic Kingdom, right next to the teacups. I would also replace the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh, restoring Magic Kingdom's unique version of Mr. Toad's Wild Ride in its place, while constructing a better attraction for the Winnie the Pooh IP in another show building past Alice in Wonderland. Those three attractions should be able to fill up the space that the Tomorrowland Speedway currently occupies, revealing how much wasted potential is sitting there. Before I move on to other expansion though, I do want to make some quick additions to what currently exists. Once these other small dark rides open, I would close Peter Pan's flights for a lengthy refurb, bringing in updated effects like in Disneyland. I would also add in a small, child-friendly flat ride in Storybook Circus, where the yellow tent currently sits though I don't currently have any ideas for what kind of ride or theme it might be. I would also add general details to Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, because rock work, no matter how well executed, just isn't theming. When you're going around the ride track, I want riders to be able to spot props or details like small forest animals or discarded mining equipment that add to the world building. Overall, I would leave the Little Mermaid alone, adding in some marginal improvements here and there, but generally, I think it's fine as is. The largest transformation of Fantasyland would start with the Beauty and the Beast area. If you tore out Enchanted Tales with Belle with the Be Our Guest restaurant, you could probably just squeeze in the ride from Tokyo. The issue with space here is that this area backs up to the bus loop where cast members enter the Utilidors from, so it can't really be expanded beyond here without it becoming a logistical nightmare. To be honest, the area is fine even if it takes up more space than I think it should, but I at least like that it's going for the Enchanted Forest theme as well. If I'm going to keep this area, I would just improve the food quality of Be Our Guest. However, the largest change will come to the village, which will work as a transition area to a major expansion. What I would propose is tearing out the bathrooms back here and building an enclosed themed bridge over the road where the cast member buses travel. Back here is an immense plot of land currently occupied by Stormwater Basins, the Magic Kingdom Railroad, and a fireworks launch site. However, I feel that with creative planning, this could turn into a whole new expansion for Fantasyland with more shops, dining, and attractions. Rerouting this infrastructure and the railroad tracks, I would first add a frozen attraction on the east plot of land, recreating the mountains of Arendelle as Disney has been planning with its frozen expansions throughout its parks. However, unlike Frozen Ever After, which I would remove from Epcot, I would want a more interesting, ambitious dark ride to go here. On the west side of this land though, it could definitely transition to a darker Disney Villains area. I know that the idea for a Disney Villains park is popular online, and while I think it's an overall poor idea, I do think it makes sense in a small dose here. Right up against the Rivers of America could be a Maleficent Dragon roller coaster, reviving the idea of the cancelled Animal Kingdom Dragon Coaster, but tying this into Fantasyland instead. Obviously, the attraction would be designed in such a way as to hide the show building thematically from people on the Liberty Square Riverboat. Nearby, I would also propose a smaller boat ride, using the technology from the Shanghai version of Pirates of the Caribbean that allows the boats to turn, but instead bringing riders along the River Styx to experience Hades' underworld. This general plot of land back here is massive, and could include other smaller rides as well from other Disney animated films. Still, I think I proposed more than enough to really help build out and revive Magic Kingdom's Fantasyland. I hope I've sparked your interest with the ideas I proposed, and I would be interested to see what people think of them. While I appreciate Disneyland's Fantasyland for what it is, I wouldn't quite clone everything over. 
In fact, I'm not sure if Tokyo's Beauty and the Beast attraction would even make sense here either, and I kind of like the idea of keeping it unique to its own park. Still, I think that Fantasyland as it currently exists is, like most things Disney these days, completely underbuilt and underwhelming. New Fantasyland didn't really reach its goals of adding capacity to the Magic Kingdom in any meaningful way, and its two actual rides are underwhelming. Ten years later, it's a project that only had a marginally positive impact on the park, and it seems like a lot of wasted potential. Fantasyland could be great if Disney really wanted it to be, but the current leadership in the company has absolutely no idea how to use limited space effectively. If it can be done in Disneyland, I don't see why it couldn't be done in the Magic Kingdom. There is of course the issue of high demand, resulting from pretty much any new thing that debuts at the parks, so I imagine that many of these smaller dark rides I proposed would be overrun this first few months or so, especially with little space to manage those crowds. Still, the abundance of small attractions in Disneyland is what allows that park to absorb its crowds so well, and so long term, attractions like these would help dramatically. The issue with addressing capacity effectively in Disney parks is something that current leadership thinks that they can solve by pricing people out. I take a different approach, focusing on expanding capacity and the overall experience, regardless of the operational costs, because I know that Disney is more than capable of absorbing them. Disney's largest draw to its most attended park is generally underwhelming, so these were just a few ideas of mine in regards to fixing it. I would definitely be interested in hearing other people's ideas, and if you want to see more videos like these, I would like to once again ask you to hit the like button on the video if you hadn't done so earlier. I also recommend hitting the subscribe button with bell notification so as to be alerted to new videos when they're released.